Guys, welcome back. Another episode of RX Radio. Um, this one coming to you live. Again, Columbus, Ohio. Man, we knocked out a lot. It was We were only there for like 26 hours, which was pretty wild. Uh, this one, one of my favorites. Uh, as much as shit as I give him, he's legitimately, he's the Elon Musk of regenerative medicine. And, you know, soon regenerative medicine will be medicine on the whole. Uh, like, I'm with this guy, you know, maybe once a month, twice a month. Um, Akon is my, he's definitely become a, a close friend over the years, pushing the envelope, uh, pushing uh, the borders of what's possible when it comes to medicine. Like this episode will quite literally blow your fucking mind of what's coming down the pipe. Dwayne's treated me uh, a handful of times now. My right shoulder, if some of you guys have been following for a long time from my powerlifting career, um, had a really bad torn pec and it's led to just a ton of issues that I can keep at bay, but the pain is always kind of ever present, you know cut one treatment with a deal and i'm not blowing smoke up your ass not really our style here um shoulder pain fucking sweet um haven't had issues since has some of the best training sessions i've had since the pack tear uh the stuff he's doing with regenerative medicine we talk about tissue engineering um we talk about uh, uh genetic editing some wild stuff that's coming down the pipe we talk about how long can human beings live for um, what's upcoming in the in the field of regenerative medicine longevity health performance uh akon's finger on the pulse this dude will change the world mark my words you can refer back to this episode if you want when this guy wins a nobel prize um so i'm calling it now future nobel prize winner dr adil khan uh on the episode today and just always so great to have a deal if you guys um our interesting fucking quick hard pivot. Appreciate you, deal. Hopefully that's got their attention. It's got them all warmed up. Uh, Prescript level one, uh, now currently up for sale. It's the end of the month. We're going to be starting the next semester midway through the uh, January of the new year. Uh, get in quick. Seats last semester were insane. We're finishing up, uh, would it be like week 12 of this current semester? Uh, head on over to www.pre-script.com. Functional Anatomy Applied Biomechanics course, you get free access to Prescript Collective, um, which is has our Emerging Ideas lecture series, it has our Technique Labs, it has our Discord channel, it has our lit- literature review, um, uh, literature review component. It has uh, you know six weekly labs on top of that. If you're looking at 96 lab hours, 16 lecture hours taught four times a week, just to make sure that you guys want to hop in live, that you can see it live. And but if you can't uh, or you don't want to, we can always you always get to have access to it forever in your online student portal, um, plus the Prescript Level One manual. If you're in Australia. Or you're looking to hang out in Australia, we'll be doing an in-person intensive that comes along with the L1 digital product. So you get all 16 weeks, all the bullshit I just uh, talked about. And you get two days hands-on application going through some of the more tactile principles uh, within the course really helps accelerate it. So that's going to be at Lionstone Physique. Both of these are currently up for sale on the Prescript website. So we head over to www.pre-script.com. If you're looking to sign up for Australia, seats are super, super, super limited. And uh, they're under the on-site courses. Just go to Melbourne L1. Or if you're looking to just hang out online, semester is going to start, like I said, mid-January. Go and secure your seat. www.pre-script.com should be up on the homepage. If not, a little PSL1 tab there on the top right in the red square. So go hop in, grab your seat. Again, Akon, appreciate your time as always. Everyone uh, subscribing on YouTube. As well as subscribing on Spotify and iTunes, we really appreciate it. Uh, share it with your friends, and you know maybe we'll put an end to Boomer Fitness one day, which is something that Adil and I talk about in the episode. Uh, so, guys, do enjoy the episode. We'll see you guys next week. Lundy, hit it. You're tuned in to RX Radio. What's uh, what's happening, man? Welcome back, Acon. Back in the fucking back on the ones and twos, dude. How you been? Yeah, there's so much that's changed, as you've seen probably online a little bit, but it's gone a long way from just PRP to cell and gene therapy. Now, how many people are worldwide are really, by your estimation, pushing this discipline or sub-discipline forward? Dude, it's like the hot topic. All of private equity, venture capital, a lot of the big institutions, they're all putting money into anti-aging, longevity, because they all want to live forever including Peter, Peter Thiel, who's our main investor. <laughs> now, but like, yeah, money, sure, great. There's plenty of people there to take it. But like, 
pushing the envelope forward in a meaningful way. Not going down to fucking Panama and bio accelerator. Like don't go to a don't go to a shortcut to get your medical procedures. <laughs> yeah. Panama's not even a country. <laughs> like how many people exactly. are like if you open up your black book and you're like, I'm gonna call so and so and we're gonna have a high level discussion about implementation and application of cutting edge uh, regenerative medicine. How many people are you calling? Yeah, there's there's a handful. But there is China Japan, and then there's a few in U.S. and Canada and a few in Europe that are really, really like top tier and pushing the field forward. So, for example, something like tissue engineering, which is using 3D bioprinters to regrow tissue, that China is actually a leader in that. China, just, there's a textbook that just came out this year. It's called Principles of Tissue Engineering. It's the first version of this textbook, and it, it, all the authors were Chinese. Okay, so... Well, you know, we kind of got on like, yo, things have changed like crazy. It used to be PRP. Yeah. And then, you know, we uh, evolved into like the Cyto Rich PRP. Those of you guys who are kind of unfamiliar with the backstory, go back and listen to our previous podcast with the deal. But so if you were to subclassify the major frontiers of regenerative medicine, tissue engineering, PRP, what else is on the list? Exactly. Like, yeah. So it's those two. And then it's two bar- broad categories, which is basically cell therapy and gene therapy or gene editing. So, and then combining cell therapy, gene therapy, and tissue engineering together is where we're headed. So combining those three. And I will tell you how we're doing that. It's the fucking Thanos glove of medicine. It is. It literally is. That's a perfect analogy because you're taking the specificity and precision that you need from cell therapy and then customizing it to the patient using gene editing and tissue engineering. I, d- I don't even know <laughs> where my brain right now. Yeah, well, it's just <laughs> okay. So, exclusion criteria. Maybe that's a good place to start, right? I, I started my my radar started going off for turmeric when people were like, "Yeah, you just take it." <laughs> yeah. like, uh, like, how much? I like all of it, all of it, <laughs> until you're like yellow. Like, so there's no adverse side effects of taking too much. Nope. I'm like, there's probably no benefit of taking it at all. <laughs> yeah. So exclusion criteria, and that big, was a problem right? with stem cells too. Okay. So let's talk about stem cells a bit because. When I first came on the show, obviously I was skeptical. And the reason was because the research wasn't there yet, but there was signs pointing to, hey, maybe there's something there. But it just wasn't there. But in the last five years, it's kind of exploded. And what's called bioprocessing, which is basically the manufacturing of how we grow these stem cells, has improved tremendously. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? That means basically the quality of the stem cells and the viability, meaning the survivability of the stem cells, has drastically improved. And be- this is because of innovations in manufacturing. I always equate it to like innovations in like electric vehicle battery manufacturing. Like if to manufacture batteries in 2010 was really hard. Literally, Elon Musk just took a bunch of like laptop batteries and put them together and put them in the car. And it was like, okay, let's hope this works. And then, but then they've, they're, now they're manufacturing their own batteries and they're so much more efficient. And, they've, and they have different uh, processing methods too. So it's not just lithium ion anymore. So it's the same thing with stem cells. It's not just about growing umbilical cord stem cells in the old way. There's new ways to grow them. And that new innovation has made it so much more effective. And then not only that, we're adding that second tier and that third tier to it about using scaffolds to increase the survivability of the stem cells. And then on top of that, you can use gene editing to manipulate the cells to do what you want. So I'll give you the perfect example of what we're doing now. So umbilical cord stem cells, most people know about it. They're like, yeah, you know, you get it from the baby after C-section, you know, you collect them, you harvest them, you grow them. So that's been around for a while. That's where people go in Panama and stuff like that. But those stem cells actually don't stick around in your body that long. They're there for maybe like three, four weeks because even though they're immunoprivileged, there's still an immune response. So your immune system is still like, hey, this is a foreign invader. Let's get this out of here. So within like three, four weeks, those stem cells are cleared up. So they still have signals they send to your body, which allows for repair, anti-inflammatory effects. So they still can work, but they're not really regrowing new tissue. So the way we worked around this is was like, hey, is there a way that we can cloak these cells from your body so that your immune system doesn't recognize them and it doesn't trigger that immune response? I always think of it like, did you ever see Harry Potter? Have I seen Harry Potter? <laughs> he said cloak, and I was like, oh, Harry Potter, let's go. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Remember that cloak they wore, and then you disappeared? That cloak. So that's a cloak. That's a, yeah, exactly. So that clo- imagine you do that on a stem cell. So, you're, so these are called hypoimmune gene-edited 
stem cells. And so basically they're not being triggered by your immune system, so they stick around longer. And what we're doing is we're combining that with scaffolds, so that, and the scaffolds are hydrogels, which are basically like hyaluronic acid polymers. And those hydrogels also create like a physical barrier to pr protect you from your immune system. So that's the whole goal of this. It's basically like, let's make these cells stick around as long as possible so that can, they can actually regrow into new tissue. So what we're doing now, we're just starting a clinical trial using what are called gene-edited iPSC-derived MSCs embedded in 3D bioprinted hydrogel scaffolds. And so essentially what that means is that these iPSC cells are genetically engineered because y there's a Nobel Prize from Japan. He's called uh, Professor Yamanaka. He won the Nobel Prize for what are called the Yamanaka factors. He basically figured out that you could take any cell. The Japanese are so smart. So and that's why I worked in Japan this year and learned a ton. But they figured out that you can take any cell in your body and you can overexpress these four transcription factors and you can turn them back into a baby stem cell. How crazy is that? That your body has a memory to, that's what I mean, your body has this memory to heal itself and we're just trying to unravel that mystery. Uh, one of the great questions I wanted to kind of dig into, or big topics I wanted to dig into, and it seems like it's pertinent to kind of break way into the topic now, is ethics, right? The big thing with stem cell, what was Christopher Reeves, was it the original uh, Superman? He ended up with like a spinal cord issue and there was like a big advocate, he was an advocate for stem cell research if I'm getting that story right. But there, then there was like, you kind of ran into like the abortion crowd at the same time and you're like, this is weird. Why is a guy in a wheelchair picking against like, you know, mothers from the church group? Like this is nuts. And there was always a conversation of like, okay, the ethical harvesting of stem cells and you, you use the word manufacturing a lot, which is like, a really interesting word to use for what was previously an ex seemingly like an extraction process, right? And so I, I want to talk about the ethics specifically around stem cells first. And then you've used the word editing and engineering a handful of times. And the last guy to use a word like that was God, to whatever <laughs> one you believe. Like, I'd be really curious as to like how, you know, how innovation runs alongside ethics when you guys are do playing God. There is a lot of ethical issues to consider. So the first one to address is obviously, are these cells being sourced ethically, meaning are em any embryos being harmed? So no, we're not sourcing them from embryonic tissue. The reason during Reeves' time, there was only embryonic stem cells at that point, because embryonic stem cells are from the fetus, right? They're from the embryos. And they were, they're obviously the most potent because they have, they're, they're what's called totipotent, which means they have a, ability to turn into any type of tissue in your body. And they also have an ability to regrow new tissue. They have more stemness than mesenchymal stem cells, which are derived from umbilical cord tissue. So that meaning they have a more ability to proliferate and grow new tissue. But then the risk of that is that tumors and eye cancer. Bone. Exactly. Eye bone. Right. Exactly. And we talked about that last time. Why did that happen? Because that was embryonic stem cells. And so they are, they have too much stemness and that can lead to un foreseen circumstances, like unforeseen consequences. And back then, because they only had embryonic, they were kind of like, well, you're going to be hurting embryos. Like, you can't do that. So people, then people transitioned over into umbilical cord tissue, mesenchymal, because mesenchymal, they're not as strong as embryonic, but they still have good properties in terms of reducing inflammation. They can treat like soft tissue injuries, autoimmune conditions, but they're not really regrowing new tissue. So now with the genetic era, the let's call it genomic era, we can actually edit those Yamanaka factors into a cell and those, and it's called an induced pluripotent stem cell, iPSC cell. And the iPSC cell has the same stemness and the same properties as an embryonic stem cell. And you can just take it from a skin s s tissue biopsy. So you're just regressing it down to its, its, its exactly. starting point. Exactly. I mean, that to me, like a very surface level, like that's not just, that's not just longevity. Like that's, re that sounds like a reversal process. Cause like the process of synthesizing that, I don't know if that's the right term, back to embryonic, it seems to defy, it has certainly it defies some sort of medical principle or some sort of. It, no one thought that was possible. When Yamanaka did it, everyone was just like, that's. That's insane. That's why he won the Nobel Prize. Right, I guess it was so. just like, well, this is unbelievable. And it's still hard to appreciate how big of a discovery that is because it's basically like saying your body, wait a minute, I can take your old ass, like you can be 60 years old, I can take your old cell 
and I can make it into a baby stem cell. Like that's wild yeah. because that, that then opens up the box for saying, wait a minute, maybe we can cure aging or maybe we can reverse aging or maybe we can just stop it all together. So that's where this is all headed. And that's why, but then to the point about iPSC cells, as we were talking about embryonic cells, because they're so strong, they can also have uncontrolled proliferation. So the technology we have, we basically gene edit these iPSC cells so it has a kill switch to prevent uncontrolled proliferation. And then they're also gene edited with the cloaking mechanism. So that's what we're using now. Wow. So, Gene, I mean, the, the, I mean, I think a big part of the ethical conversation is when the word editing gets thrown around. Yeah. Right. Like, do you think we're maybe before we dive into the, the, the intricacies of it, do you, do you think we're headed towards a medical singularity? Yeah. Well, I mean, let's give the did you ever hear about the guy in China, the d scientist doctor who went to jail for editing embryos? No. So is this yeah. like one child policy stuff. No, like, no, no. Hey, everyone's no. getting he was, boys. No, he well, he was editing them to do basically to say that because then you can edit embryos to have certain eye colors, a certain height. So he's coming up like with designer <laughs> pugs. Yeah, like his your kid is Brindle <laughs> and has one blue eye and one brown eye. <laughs> That's why they put him in jail. But I'm a hundred percent sure. It sounds like the most Chinese thing to do. I'm a hundred percent sure China and Russia is still doing it, and they are just not telling anyone. So it's just because they have that technology. What's stopping them, right? Yeah. And so it is an ethical thing because now you have a society where you can start editing embryos to select for certain things. And then all of a sudden you have these people who have money and access and then you get a – because who can afford that stuff? Well, it's the only people who have money. And then now the disparity between the rich and poor will become even more because you have a society where you have these gene-edited embryos that are – getting better feature higher iq higher whatever so it's like you i mean it, it's like the eugenics principle but just medically mediated the idea of like selective reproducing based off of you know like a, you know it's almost like a range marriage people like okay she's 511 she's got blue eyes growing hair she has a you know it's like it's like breeding dogs essentially it's like but now well, that's why they put him in jail but i'm pretty sure they did that for optics, optics. Yeah. yeah yeah chinese government's been known <laughs> to do that a time or two yeah. i want to know what happens when this goes wrong yeah exactly and that's and that's going to happen the cloaking mechanism scares me why? That's so cool. But it's cool, <laughs> but like to, yeah, it's cool if it's used to hide your immune system from something that's. Oh, right. Bioweapons? <laughs> yeah, well, I don't, I, don't, I don't know, man. Like, I guess the medical community obviously fell under a ton of scrutiny with the events of the last four or five years, right? And, and the, you know, the decades leading into it that allowed an event to, like, like the whole COVID thing to happen. And it could be probably closely correlated to, like, the AIDS outbreak. As far as just a, a total unknown of the origin of it, how to manage it, you know, this you could argue the social ramifications were much less uh, or much higher, but the the, the actual uh, death toll was much less than, and less severe than HIV and AIDS. But yeah, I mean, I, I, who's I, I I look at this and I use the word singularity and actually it starts to make me think about AI and the emergence of AI and yeah. the safety behind some of this stuff, right? Like, you know, there are people who are like. Yo, I left Google because I'm the AI guy at Google. And it's already off the chain. Like we're all fucked, and I need to come tell the world. How what how is how do you keep a series of checks and balances with things like this? Now you mentioned a kill switch and a thing, but it's like okay, what if this just gets in the hands of someone else? Like what are the what are the net what are the what are the potential cons of this? No, it's it's. I mean, unfortunately, even now, there's a lot of criticism about what we're doing because most of the treatments we do are only accessible by the rich. Mm -hmm. And so it's becoming like the people who have money can live longer, feel better, basically redefine the aging process because they have access to this technology. But my argument is that the only way we're going to democratize health for everyone is that this technology becomes accessible to everyone. And the way we do that is there has to be early adopters, just like when the plasma TVs used to be like a hundred thousand dollars for <laughs> whatever, and now they're a lot cheaper. So the only if we can give this technology access, if we can make this accessible to everyone, at like a my vision is like imagine you go into your family doctor, you get these gene therapies, you get these stem cells, and you're basically preventing almost all chronic diseases. Like that would be the that's the future I I envision with this stuff. Not where it's like we're creating this society where only the elite have the best, and everyone else at the bottom is just like struggling to keep up because that's that is a scenario that could happen if the wrong people get this technology i think because my view on it is that it's all about accessibility and equity
But there's obviously people out there who want to use this, like that doctor in China, who want to use this to their own means, to, like to kind of do whatever they want to do. Um, but I, I really, I really don't think it's going to go down. I mean, with AI, I think Elon Musk obviously has con voice concerns. Everyone has kind of voice concerns. This is similar in the sense that if it's getting in, if it goes into the wrong people's hands, there's definitely a possibility or scenario where it just creates huge inequality in society, like widens it. When in reality, this technology should be lessening that equality gap. My concern is like from a biological level. I'm a big Jurassic Park guy. Don't know if you can <laughs> tell, but the idea, like the old, uh, what is it, Jeff Goldblum, like the life finds a way thing it's like okay you, you know imagine being the first person to you know understand like germ theory and then understand uh you know that this is bacteria and then they come up with antibiotics and it's like well this should kill all of the things that makes us sick and then what come, then all of a sudden you get resistant strains is there a world where a pathology could naturally manifest itself that we can't overcome it like, do you see that? Does, does that thought process cross your mind? Or is it just like a different subset of medicine, a different, like a different pathway that we're dealing with that, that we should always be able to be at the driver's seat of like this process? Well, COVID was manufactured in the lab, right? Right. So that is, I think, definitively goes without saying now. And that's what happens with gain of fire, like, you know, gain of function research, right? And so that is a consequence of what happens when things get into the wrong people's hands. And it, it basically devastated the world and we're still not recovering from that. So I think the same thing can happen with this stuff. Like if, if you have people start playing around with the gene editing in, in embryos and with delivering these cell therapies into, I mean, in, into the wrong hands, essentially like the wrong, and they have the wrong kind of intentions behind it. I mean, I, yeah, it's definitely possible. Like I think with AI, there's it's more tangible because people can see like, hey, if AI takes over, they're basically going to become self-aware and then they're going to say humans suck and like because they're, they're destroying the planet or whatever and they're going to just want to do whatever. Like that's that's kind of the narrative that you know some of the people who are worried about AI are talking about. I think with this stuff, it's a bit it's a bit harder to know. I think, but like, let's say in 15 years, we can reproducibly edit embryos to exactly how we want them to be and make designer babies, oh, then that's, so weird. that's such a weird world we live in. Is that unethical? I mean, I think it is, but at the same time, like, I think there's going to be people who are going to want that. And like, how do you, like, as a doctor, do we just, as a scientist, do we just make that not a possibility? Because we're opening up, yeah, a whole, it's a whole, it's a really tough debate. I don't know what the right answer is. See, I think. <laughs> I don't know. Your kids are adorable. So can I get a half Pakistani, <laughs> yeah, half yeah, Asian? Yeah, exactly. I would like one of those. Say, yeah. I would like one of those. Yeah. Yeah. Add to cart, add to cart. Yeah, um, <laughs> I, I mean, <laughs> so a deal. My understanding on, I mean, I'm still trying to grasp all this. This is all very new to me. But my understanding on aging is like cell oxidation is a big part of it. I've heard like telomere unraveling as a thing. Um and like irreparable tissue damage, right? So if that's no longer a factor, is it possible that people just could not die? Y yeah, if there's 10 hallmarks of aging. So the tel 10 hallmarks of aging, you named two of them, telomere attrition and chronic inflammation or oxidative stress. And there's one called dysregulated nutrient sensing. There's mitochondrial dysfunction. There's all these like different things that happen at a cellular level. Mm -hmm. And so if we can basically turn off all these hallmarks of aging or slow them down because most of them are actually mediated by chronic inflammation and oxidative stress. Those are like the two biggest ones by far. And that's why inflammation is being thrown, a lot, thrown around a lot, even though I kind of hate that word. It sucks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, it's so annoying. Exactly. It's so that's, that's so funny. I think that's, I can't say that publicly. I, 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 can't. I got you. <laughs> but I, but it's, it's, it's annoying because it's just like, uh, anyway. But the point is, if, uh, and that's why We'll talk about, I'm sure we're going to talk about it, the Follistatin gene therapy is so fascinating because it can extend the time in which you can do heavy resistance training and reduce inflammation in your body. Because Follistatin is a peptide that basically inhibits myostatin and then the gene therapy we've de delivered, it basically, sends a, it basically tells your body to increase Follistatin production to levels of like where you were like when you're 18. So essentially you're fighting and reversing the aging process. And that's why the false data we have, it actually set a world record for intrinsic biological age reduction just with one intervention. So <laughs> it, it increased, there's one hyper responder. His intrinsic biological age went down by 63 years. 
Which doesn't even make sense, right? He's like six. What? You can't be sixty years younger. So he was like really not taking care of himself. <laughs> so what was it? What was he? He was eighty. <laughs> oh wow. Okay. And then now he says he's, but he says he feels eighteen. Yeah. So he actually says clinically, he's like, wow. I feel so great. And then we're trying to, we're doing microbiome sequencing and sequencing on him to figure out why was he such a hyper responder? Because most people get twelve years at over sixty. So if someone like that who's getting like sixty years is like, what the hell? This doesn't even make sense. But it's like there's obviously something to this whole paradigm of muscle and inflammation as a main drivers of aging because if we can if we can f- imagine you're 100 and you're still squatting like 315 or something yeah. i think that's really possible with what we have developed already what we have and this is just the beginning wow. and so, so imagine because i'm gonna do, like i'm gonna do the false data in every one and a half two years like obviously jordan will like a lot of people will be doing it right because and what then you're not going to lose muscle and you're going to maintain it so even when you're 60 you still have strength you still have, so why how like why would you be aging you know what i mean you would be aging technically a little bit but it's gonna be so much drastically slower so is there a theoretical lifespan with this type of therapy? I think we're – right now we're estimating at least 150. Uh, <laughs> oh. and, but I think, I think, you know, I think with genetic engineering, this could be pushed way beyond that. So is that – now this is the question I always have because the lifespan thing comes up a lot. It's based off of the technology we have today or based off of the projection of the technology into the next 30, 40 No, even with just what we have today. Okay. So because we have the fo- – we're the only group in the world that has a statin, right? And yeah. so that's the world's best anti-aging therapy. Like, it's, it's ne- we have a phase one trial to push it. Uh, it's being published. And uh, so that's already data out there. Yeah. Now, if you were to do it at, on, a, on a curve and extrapolate out, just not just from where we are currently and putting statin into the world and watching its effects through you know, decades, generations, but starting to plot the graph with the rate in which we're making these significant developments in regenerative medicine, what is the lifespan if we keep at this pace or we start to, you know... Dude, I, it's, I it's, it's like Moore's Law. It's, I mean, it's not... Maybe not quite like a semiconductor or like computer chip, but like, man, the, the rate at which this stuff is accelerating is insane. Everyone is investing into regenerative. It's becoming like a buzzword now. It's almost annoying when people say, I'm a regenerative medicine doctor. I'm like, yeah. no, you're not. Where, where do you practice? <laughs> yeah. My <laughs> first Florida? Yeah, yeah, let me tell you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I'm yeah. a yeah. drug dealer. <laughs> yeah. 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 So <laughs> it's, it's becoming a buzzword where everyone wants to be in regenerative medicine. Me and you were talking about it like six years ago. Like I've been into this since like literally since I started practicing. But now it's everyone's like finally sees that this is the future. So in 10 years from now, I think almost every doctor will have some sort of regenerative medicine part of their practice, which is fine. But... That also means there's a lot more minds, a lot more research, and a lot more innovation that's going on. So our plan, you know, with our company is kind of be the guys who figure out the best emerging tech and then acquire those so we can keep developing and keep being the leaders in this field. You're going to be the Google. Exactly. Wow. So because emerging tech is by far, the, I would say, the most difficult skill set in identifying what's the best. Because there's like a million things out there now. Everyone wants to do longevity and regenerative medicine. It's actually, it's so annoying. And, and like... Longevity to me is it's also a bullshit word because it basically is just like, you know, this doctor who's just going around recycling all the fitness industry stuff that we've been talking about for 20 years. Protein, <laughs> yeah. muscle, yeah. like, thanks. Yeah. like, Go thanks, like, step up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, but that's not, to me, that's not real longevity. Real longevity is what we're doing, which is we can extend the health span of you being able to lift heavy, work out, li- feel good. That's what it's all about. And because everyone, like everyone, kind of already knows about the basics, but now it's like, how can we intervene so you can do the basics as long as possible? But I think dualism in the medical com- community has set people, set the industry, set the world back a lot. Like the separation of mind and body as two separate entities and that are that are treated differently, I think, has been a disservice of common Western medicine since its inception. Now. You know, if you let me lift weights until I'm 150, how are you equating or what is, how does this work in what is currently seen as more specialized tissue like central nervous system tissue, brain tissue? How do we stop aging? You know, yeah, oh, this guy looks great. Why is he drooling at both sides of his mouth? Because he's actually Frodo Baggins and he's 145 <laughs> years old. It's like, oh, he looks, he looks like he's 35. It's like, yeah, but his brain looks like fucking mush peas. That's, and that's why you got to come back to first principles like we talk about, right? And so what's the main mediator of aging? It's immune senescence and immune tolerance and immune dysfunction. So essentially your immune system. And so a dysfunctional immune system, and we know now the immune system and the nervous system communicate as well. And so if you keep that immune system from becoming dysfunctional, which 
by far the best way to do that is through muscle. There's a lot, there's papers on that that came out recently that muscles actually help to, uh, they help with something called T regulatory cells, which are kind of always putting the brakes on your immune system and regulating how it works in terms of the signaling cascade. And so those T reg cells are so important. And as you get older, they become dysfunctional. And so if you can, but now we know that by having muscle mass, it actually prevents them from becoming dysfunctional. So if we can keep that preservation of those T-reg cells, then you're not going to get those senescence. You're not going to get that immune dysfunction that's going to cause that inflammation in the brain and cause you to drool and all that crap. Okay. So like, you know, things like dementia, you know, people are calling dementia now like type three diabetes, which I think is really shattering the, the paradigm of the duality between like mind and body, which I, I think is again, like a real disservice. So you're saying that these things won't necessarily act directly on the brain, but as direct as indirectly as things act on the brain as it currently stands. Is that kind of it? Exactly. But guess what our next product is? It's for the brains. Okay. <laughs> Shoot. So it's called Clotho. So Spell that for me. K-L-O-T-H-O. Is that an acronym for something? No, it's a peptide. Okay. And it's a peptide that's actually secreted in response to exercise. So folostatin and clotho are both peptides that get released when you do high intensity resistance training. Your levels transiently go up. And the, and the reason for that is because they have all these effects in terms of folostatin, like we already talked about, inflammation, myostatin inhibition. But clotho, it protects against neurodegeneration. And it's been shown to increase your IQ by six points on average. Wow. <laughs> so I'm I'll definitely... Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You're good. Yeah, Fuck yeah. you. You're brilliant. <laughs> no, <right? I> <laughs> uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take two and see what happens. <laughs> uh, yeah. So so my vision is imagine you come into like an eternal clinic. You get these different gene therapies. You get clotho. You get falstatin. And we have a few others in the works. And then you get your... If you need stem cells, then you're just, you're just delaying that whole aging process. Can you explain to me, so in having the fall set and done, in kind of following you along and, 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 you know, getting to chat with you kind of behind the Iron Curtain as this stuff has been developed, can you explain the vector process of like what you have planned with cloth or what you're already doing for follow statin? Because that to me is of all the stuff that I can understand, which I'm sure there's stuff that's like crazy if I understood it, but I'm too dumb to understand it. I'm dumb enough to understand the, the mechanism of delivery. When you explained it to me, it's still blowing my mind. So clotho, folostatin, and the other you know hormones and peptides that you guys have having come down this product line, how does it work? It is, yeah, it is actually very cool. And it's, it is groundbreaking actually. So Viral vectors were always kind of the transfection agent. A transfection agent is just like what you're using to encode whatever gene you want to tell your body, and that's what a gene therapy is, right? What would be some examples of viral vectors used in the past? Adeno-associated virus, AAV or lentivirus. These are just like, but the problem, because the, the reason they were used is because they're ease of use in the lab and um, they don't have to be manipulated. But then the problem was they're expensive to manufacture and then they also can translocate. And when they translocate, that can obviously affect your genome and cause infections and just people who's died, died from it. It's rare, but it's happened. And so... So just, just to catch people up, because this is fucking insane. Yeah. <laughs> Previously, they were using viruses to carry good things around the body. It's like, well, viruses are very good at spreading quickly. L but let's change the message to something good. Viruses are maybe not the most stable way to do it. You can you translocate. They can actually just turn into the damn virus that you're using, which is like, oh, well, all the good it's carrying <laughs> yeah. completely wiped out by all the bad of the virus itself. But the vehicle being so virulent, being able to get through the body, is a great vector to carry the good thing around. So that was what they used to do. Yeah. And the problem is once you have a virus, it's also not reversible. And so people were always interested in something called plasmids. So... Plasmid is basically a circular strand of DNA that exchanges information. It's of bacterial origin, but there's no actual live bacteria in there. So it's just a circular strand of DNA, hence the name mini circle. And so that mini circle can be used to transfect a local piece of tissue with whatever gene of interest we want. And it just stays in that tissue and it tells your body to increase production of that gene of interest. So, for example, with the statin gene therapy or clotho, it's such an easy, admin it's literally just an injection in your subcutaneous, or we're actually looking at statin in the muscle now, because it seems like it might be even better, more effective. Yeah, exactly. You're gonna, we're going to do it on your muscle, yeah. <laughs> and so, it's, and it's so easy to administer, 
And it's also reversible because it's of bacterial origin. So if you take a tetracycline because it's of E. coli origin, then it's actually a kill switch. So meaning if for whatever reason you want this out of your body, you can just take an antibiotic and it's out. Wow. And it's it's such a cool technology. And I it's be, it, we're going to publish it in Nature Biotech. And I think Walter and Mac, who are the inventors of it, the two scientists, they... I mean, I think they, did, they, did, they deserve a Nobel Prize at some point for this because it's just like unbelievable tech. And because of the ability to scale it, because you can, it's, it's temperature stable, it's easy to transport, it has all these amazing kind of safety measures in there in case something goes wrong, which is like almost impossible. And you can target anything with 100% specificity. There's no offsite targets. Because you know with CRISPR, like gene editing, there's the offsite targets. This is just one protein peptide, gene of interest, always 100% reproducible each time. So for those of you who may not have followed along, yeah. listening to him talk about this is like listening to a song that you really like. Like it, you don't, once you hear it, you hear it again, you're like, I really like hearing that. <laughs> <laughs> you use essentially like what someone might say is like attenuated E. coli. E. Yeah. coli, yes. that's not E. coli. Yes. So E. coli right. that like, you know, eat your fucking romaine lettuce. You're not going to shit for three days. It's just the vehicle of E. coli. Which obviously we haven't ever had E. coli. I drank the water in southwestern Ontario, or Detroit <laughs> River, more specifically. It's like okay, not good. You're using that, and you're taking your peptide or hormone of choice, and just putting that on the wagon, and that goes around the body at the same rate as E. coli, the non-attenuated bacterial infection would. But rather than having all the bad shit. It's you're carrying signaling for either a hormone or a peptide for like a really long time. Yeah, one and a half to two years, That's which is insane. which is great. And then it could just be repeated. That's the beauty of it. And it's, every time it's repeated, you get the same response. So it's not like it's not like diminishing returns. That's nuts, dude. Now, we're you know these vectors are groundbreaking technology. Is there an application? I mean, I, I don't know why I'm defaulting to mental here, but like, I don't know. I like taking drugs. Like, not like I like taking mushrooms. I think I think drugs are fun. Psilocybin is one of the best examples of what nature has provided for us. That incredible for PTSD, depression. Can we anything. attach that to the old E. coli train, <laughs> and I don't have to yeah. eat like fucking yeah. five squares <laughs> of chocolate every morning? Like, that'd be unreal. Jack, me with that shit. So you're gonna oh, love this. Jesus you're gonna love this. Christ. <laughs> one of our targets of interest is called the bliss gene. Guess what the bliss gene Sounds does? Dangerous. Yeah. It's amentadine, which is basically a signal in your body that makes you happier, that protects against like depression. It basically it makes colors more vibrant, mm. and it basically just increases overall well-being. It's called the bliss gene, that's and that's going to be one of our gene therapy products. So we want to make everyone in the world happier. How? <laughs> I mean, how do you guys make decisions? Understanding. We just want to make everyone happy and jacked. Yeah, but like, like how do, smarter. How that's do you, it. Uh, Very simple. <laughs> uh, maybe that is the answer, but like, how much deliberation goes on in the product line development of, if at the very least, even prioritizing all the positives? Not like, hey, should we make, you know, can should we really edit babies to be like different <laughs> shit? Like, I don't know. You want your kid being five two? All right, okay, we'll do it. We'll do it. We'll do it. Like, how much? How much deliberation goes on, or is it like these things are such? These are these are the big rocks right now. Like, hey, let's make people happy. Let's make people jacked. Let's you know, protect against neurodegeneration. Let's build some muscle. Yeah, we we're, we're, we want to definitely have the ones that have the most impact on society first, and also that probably are the most economical, meaning people are interested in them. We can generate revenue, and then we can reinvest that into rare diseases. Because ultimately, we do want to do like cystic fibrosis, like retinitis pigmentosa, like conditions where they're missing, they have a mutation, and they're missing an enzyme or protein. Because we can cure those, right? And basically. That's but those are rare. They're not very common. So we have to we have to take like a top down approach where it's like okay, what's going to have the most impact on the most people and allow us to make the most revenue, and then we can reinvest that into these more rare and untreatable conditions as of now. So that's kind of the approach we're taking. But we are very open. T we we love talking with other bright people. And if you guys have any ideas, we're open to ideas about targets as well. I think so the like the bliss gene, like be the bliss mine. gene. Yeah, the bliss gene. We'll give you the bliss there. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Now, because you're operating from a principal's first perspective, you're, how concerned are you with the, like, is the, where's the downside? 
Like, do you see there being a downside, or is it like you know because you have the kill switch and the cloak thing and the and the it's like we've 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 solved for the worst. Well, case that's scenario? the thing. Exactly, we've solved for worst case scenario, and that's that's the beauty of this technology, and that's why I love the. In medicine, it's always like first do no harm, right? And that's the pro and the problem with the actual medicine that's being practiced. Yeah. They're doing so much harm, yeah, and sure. they're and a lot of times they're not helping people, or they're making them worse, or you know, or they're safer options that are like less invasive, right? And so it's that's always been my mindset about this stuff. It's like okay, this has a very low probability of causing any harm, and it has such a big upside. So why wouldn't you try this first? Then that's the whole thing about these these stem cells too. We know that there's such an upside in terms of treating musculoskeletal conditions, and there's very little harm. So why wouldn't you try that first before surgery? In general, like right. if, like for most things. So that that's kind of the approach we're taking, and I think, you know, it, it for for the gene therapy. I mean, the applications are endless. And so as a biotech company, we we kind of know how valuable it is what we have, and so we've already had a pharmaceutical company try to buy us, and we're just kind of like. No. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, because pharma, what they would do is they would shelve it. Right. Yeah. That's a powerful technology. Do you feel like, you know, you're, you've, you're in roads, and I won't name drop, like you're in roads with the most powerful people in the world. Like you're treating the most powerful people in the world. You know, I saw on your Instagram the other day, you were treating Tony Robbins, and then you treated me, which is like, you know, <laughs> just keep that shit. Don't even repost it, dog. Like just don't even, what are you doing? But it's like, how much do you feel like the social media engine and the momentum of the, uh, like, honestly, uh, the concierge medical field as, you know, necessity is a mother of all creation, right? So the concierge medical field was born out of, uh, you know, a dissatisfaction of people, high net worth individuals with the, the way the system is. And, you know, we, we're coming from Canada, which the medical system has its pros and cons, right? It's uh, obviously uh, subsidized massively by the government, but you, you're you paying for it in your time. Um, and you, I don't want to say necessarily the quality, but things move a little bit slower than they would in private industry. Do you feel like these, these innovations could be brought to market successfully in a time that social media doesn't exist? Because you guys are too, you're too big and too connected to fail, right? Like, exactly. you know, you, you are and th and that's the key podcast to all this. every week. This is the key to all this because... If we weren't backed by like Peter Thiel, for example, and he didn't buy us an island where we can do whatever research we want, it's like it would be very difficult to disrupt the medical because the medical industry is controlled by big pharma. Let's be honest; it just is. It's no, there's nothing wrong with that. Pharma has a lot of stuff that is life-saving drugs and a lot of great things, but they also have a lot of things that they've created a narrative around to because chronic disease is the most profitable business, mm -hmm. right? And so instead of trying to cure or reverse those chronic diseases, they just want to keep people on drugs because that's what works for them so instead for us it's like wait a minute we can use cell and gene therapy to reverse this or maybe we can prevent this altogether using this now with this new approach and so the way i see it the only way that we're going to get mainstream adoption is that we have to go through health canada or fda because those are the probably two toughest regulatory bodies in the world and funny enough the social media thing i actually i made it uh, one day on my story i was just like man canada sucks like i'm probably just going to leave because like this sort of slow in innovation and someone from health canada actually messaged me and then she's wow. like she's like hey i have contacts with health canada please don't leave canada we will help you to get this expedited and now i'm working with them and oh. we're going to do our phase two trial in canada yeah for so you reposted <laughs> me after Tony <laughs> yeah, Robbins. Exactly, yeah exactly <laughs> yeah Are you, so i mean obviously so, you, so there's this so the the point is there are people they're not uh, there are good people there who are trying to make the right things happen but mm -hmm. the problem is there's so much lobbyists who want their own interests but there are good people who are trying to like push this stuff forward do you feel like because you mentioned you know china with the tissue engineering uh, you know the, the the emerging research the nobel prize winning emerging research coming out of japan do you feel like at the end of the day just on like a like a the game of risk looking at the 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 geopolitical landscape of the world that countries will look at this and go look if we don't get on the boat and change the laws we are going to be generally like we're going to be royally fucked by these other countries cuz like exactly because we we spoken and you're i mean I guess you know, I might as well name drop because you said, but I, I'm speaking with the president of Croatia. I've spoken with the, the doctors king in Saudi Arabia. And like these people are all very interested in what we're doing. And they want to actually bring it to them because they're like, we want to be the leaders and show the world that this is where medicine's headed. And this is the way we want to do things because cell and gene therapy manufacturing and all this stuff is where they want to invest their money into. So the leaders of the world 
are recognizing that too. And so I, I'm just, you know, I'm just kind of the messenger of saying, hey, like if you guys don't invest in this, it's actually going to be, you're missing out because this is actually going to be better for your population for many reasons. Not just from a health perspective, but economics, because like if you look at U.S., they spend more per GDP on health than like any developed country in the world. Yet their health outcomes aren't, very, aren't are like one of the worst. So it's obviously not a money thing. It's just it's how the way is structured and what's being invested where. Yeah, it's crazy. Like uh, you know, Jordan well, still practices in the San Francisco Bay Area, and the pe the what people will do. I mean, just like not even talking about healthcare. Like what people do would get in a good school district, right? Like insane what people are going through. Yeah. Like. You know, they're, they're like living in, they're quite literally living in a P.O. box somewhere <laughs> in Mountain View. So their kid can go to Gun or, or Mountain View or Pally High or whatever. Not to mention like that principle extrapolated out to the emergent industry of medical tourism. Yeah. Right. Medical tourism is probably one of like whether it's cosmetic and people are, you know, you go to Turkey for the fucking hairline. Yeah, right. Yeah. And you go to uh, Median for the tits or whatever it is. <laughs> but like, you know, you, you go here for the veneers. People are, you know, it's one thing to look like a, a, a Sheshire or cat with a plastic smile and bolt ons. It's another thing to actually travel somewhere and be healthier. Right. But like imagine a country where not only, you know, people would travel there to get these procedures but likely i mean if i had a if there was a country that m mandated and standardized this into the healthcare system i would imagine you'd see a massive influx of people exactly that's why saudi even egypt we had a group there that reached out to us they're, they work with like the president or prime minister whoever there and they're, they're they want to put one of our clinics behind the pyramids on the nile river like it's it's going to be it's going to be unreal like it's just like and this is but it's 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 it feels like it's all just been a snowball effect, like f in the last year. Like it just literally feels like I just I was just like whoa, <laughs> and it's just because these rulers and these political leaders they are not as biased as unfortunately North America is with the pharmaceutical companies. They want what's best for their people, and like you said, like for example in the Egypt one, that clinic will be a beautiful, it's going to be a beautiful wellness spa like resort. Like you're, you're going to attract tourists from all over in the region to come fly down there and get treatments, right? Mm -hmm. And like for, like you said, like for cell and gene therapy, we want to be like the turkey of hair transplants, right? Like where it's basically like whenever people think of cell and gene therapy, they're like, oh, we got to go to this clinic. And I mean, we're the only cell and gene therapy clinics in the world. So we have a bit of a monopoly right now. I'm sure someone will come up with a gene therapy that can, can be with us soon, but for now, we're the only ones who have it. And there's there's only one other company that has something similar, but it's a viral vector and it's like four times the price and it's not as effective. So so there's no competition for us right now. So we can just kind of dominate. How difficult is it to keep intellectual property and how do you how do you gauge the ethical implications of a broad reach with competition versus running a business like you're not mother teresa at the end of the day you're great by the way okay, you're the <laughs> yeah. man but uh you know it's something where it's like at the end of the day we want the information out there we want the technology out there but you guys have you know d jumped through some pretty incredible hoops to get to where you're at how you know appraising tech or sorry appraising competition in your field you know, it sounds like what you guys are have stumbled, not stumbled upon, have worked towards is is proprietary and very difficult to replicate without stealing. Yeah. And and we do have like I think we have a seven tier near patent on it. Uh, so it'll obviously it'll be difficult for anyone to replicate. And I think if we didn't have the instant. Well, I mean, he's not an institution, but he's kind of like an institution. Like Peter Thiel is basically an yeah, institution, he's a country. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he is. And that's what I'm saying. So if we didn't have that institutional backing, I'd be a bit more worried. Yeah. But because of that, it's like you can you have that card behind you to kind of back you up when you need it. I, what I'm more worried about, uh, I mean, I don't know. Dave Asprey told me I should get a bodyguard because he's like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. That, so this guy. I got yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> you just need a skull tattoo. Oh, wait. Oh, another one? Oh, you want on the top <laughs> yeah. of the head. Okay, look. I'll, with where this is headed, I'll do a tattoo on the dome for you. No problem. <laughs> I'd say I'd quit my 9 to 5, but this is my 9 to 5. So, yeah, that's... Um, I think that's... that. I mean, it's, it sounds ridiculous, but from what I heard, when Elon Musk was working on Tesla and trying to disrupt the oil industry, he had a lot of... He had people out there who were trying to get him. I and had a patient when I was at Apple who worked in the information security department. And he was, I was like, oh, okay, so you're like firewalls and all that kind of stuff? He's like, no, I'm part of the man security for Tim Cook. And at the time, this would have been 
2012, 2013, Tim Cook's, the budget for Tim Cook's uh, personal security every year was something into the tune of like six to ten million dollars. I was like, that's nuts. I barely would recognize the guy at the time. And he goes, that's nothing. He goes, I have a friend at InfoSec over at Amazon and uh, Bezos' budget at the time was 50 million. Wow. Yeah. So it's like, you know. Me, Mike Van Wick, both, whatever. Yeah, exactly. so I'm just thinking. Walmart That's Mike Van Wick. <laughs> Mike's going to charge you, though. Get that, dra- that Drake money, okay. you know? He could charge me and then train me at the same time. Or you, or I could, either <laughs> yeah. way. But, uh, yeah, no, it's, I mean, you know you're doing something right when, you know, you, the the imminent, not maybe not imminent, but, like, the potential of that is is real. It's, I mean, it's trillions of dollars. Like, let's be let's be real. It is, because health and, that's what that's what this is, right? And it's a, it's, it's a lot of money, and people don't realize that the medical industry is being disrupted. Peptides is the perfect example of that because peptides, there's not a single human randomized controlled trial. Yet, I've done peptides. He's done peptides. Have you done peptides? No. But many, like everyone in that room downstairs has pretty much done peptides. Like millions of people have done peptides without, with either a doctor's supervision, a health coach, or just on their own. And so that's called real world evidence. So we know in the real world, there's a lot of things we can, that it works for. It doesn't work for everything, but there's a lot of things it can help with. And that's, that's so like goes against what we were taught in medical school where it was just like RCTs, you have to have multiple of them, X number, power, blah, 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 statistics, number need to treat, number need to treat, and you have to up all this data before you can say recommended treatment. It's so different now because of social media and because of the environment that we live in where you can almost disrupt the traditional pharmaceutical and hospital model by just like having be, like like less like we're in Mexico right we're doing a lot of our treatments there because we can do them legally and in Dubai we're get, we're getting we just get, we're in the process of getting approval for the fall stand too because they're okay with phase one trials in Dubai you can do stem cells as well legally for nine years Japan as well so there's not much the pharmaceutical companies can do about that how can they stop us from just using social media to because you because you actually it's very hard to advertise on Google because Google will like Google unfortunately like a lot of the big platforms with COVID, they block a lot of this stuff because they're, they're unfortunate the pharmaceutical companies want them to block it. So, but they can't block social media. They can't block podcasts. So that's the way the medical system is going to be disrupted. And it's going to be through the cell and gene therapy and stuff that's actually going to cure and reverse disease. And you're going to, as, because as we get more and more traction where we're actually making patients permanently better, there's not much that they can do to stop that. And we have the real world results to show that. So you said the last year snowballed. You feel like things have really snowballed. And I, I can attest, you know, <laughs> ships passing in the night, and, and I've, I've seen the progress and, like, just the, the vol uh, maybe not the volume of treatments, but, like, the volume of, holy shit, ACODs with who? <laughs> That's nuts. The volume of, like, crazy photos you sent me over text message of, like, guess who I'm with? <laughs> Nuts. What do you, how do you project into the next like one to three years for both like you in, as you know, like a, a, on the leading edge, the tip of the spear of the industry and the industry at large? Yeah, I, I see myself. I still love to help people on an individual level. So I think I'll always want to be a clinician. And but I will be probably just working with a lot of VIPs, politicians, entrepreneurs, like those type of people. And then using those networks and contacts to hopefully influence policy to get this stuff approved as in as many regions as possible. And then at the same time, because we do ha- we're going to open up clinics around the world, we want to also, because we have so many people who kind of want to throw, like just basically they want to invest in us, right? Because they, like so many people are interested in this field and they, they want, they want someone they trust. And cause I kind of, the mini circle technology, I was the one who kind of identified that, I guess, and like kind of brought it to market. Uh, so there's a lot of people who want to invest in me. So we're going to start our own fund. Uh, so I want to become an institution. That's that's kind of my goal. So because once you're an institution, then you can change the narrative around medicine. You can, And then you can fight other institutions. Well, I think we did one five <laughs> years ago. I think we did, did one two years ago or three years ago. We'll have to make sure we catch you next year to see your predictions and to hire me as a bodyguard. Uh, Ideal Khan uh, on Instagram at Dr. Uh, a K H A N. I got it? Yeah. Yo. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jordan Genta at Red, White, and Genta. Um, myself at the underscore muscle underscore dog. RX Radio, J Marshall Marsh, at Marshall Media. Uh, do we appreciate your time. Thank you so much for, you know, you know, we know it's limited and we know you have other VIPs to attend to. <laughs> but um, yeah, man, uh, I, I look forward to. The, the text message of who you're with tomorrow. Um, and we Goldie Hawn. Uh, yeah, Goldie Hawn. <laughs> Kurt Russell, tell him I say hi. Um, but yeah, dude, I, I appreciate everything. Stoked with what you're doing. And uh, we appreciate you uh, volunteering your time for the pod. Yeah, thanks.